I want you to feel the warm blood running through the veins of the individual that you're holding their hands. I want you to feel that warm blood. You could have got a call this morning that stated that the hand, the person that you're standing next to didn't make it through the night. You could have got a call this morning to say some violent trauma came through and took the individual out whose hand that you hold. But they made it. Would you please look to the left and the right of you? I want you to get, 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 get a look. Get a real good look. Get a real good look. Get a real good look. I want you to know the devil didn't want them to make it. I, I feel it in my spirit. I feel it in my spirit. Look to the left and the right of you. If you knew what you had to wrestle through last night. If you knew the demons that tried to take you out last night. If you knew the devil that was assigned to you to take you out last night. Oh, you would give God a praise this morning. Hallelujah. Praise Him because they made it. Praise Him because they made it through. There was a drunk driver that was assigned to run you off the road. But God said no. There was a sickness demon that came to afflict your body but God said no Woo, hallelujah there was a robber that wanted your car but God said no Let's appreciate what God did for us last night. Let's appreciate we didn't turn on the news this morning and see our friend house that was burglarized through the night. Let's appreciate that none of our kids were snatched this week on the way home from school. Let's appreciate we made it. Tell somebody, say, we made it another week. Father, we thank you. We appreciate you. We adore you. We honor you. Father God, there's no one other than you. We realize, God, that you did it. You did it. There is no one that has been more faithful and gracious than you are. You did it. You did it again. And we thank you for it. And we appreciate you for the wonderful blessings that you've bestowed upon us this morning. Touch us. Guide us. Strengthen us. Take us higher, take us higher, take us higher in your word, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Somebody give God a praise in the house, hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. God is good, hallelujah. Every now and then, it's just good to have a good praise service, hallelujah. It's just good to have a good good old-fashioned praise service hallelujah amen we're glad that the Lord has blessed us again there is so many other things that I wanted to share this morning but the Lord just took over amen and we are we are fine with that amen amen uh, I want you to turn with me to Colossians 3 uh, verse 23 and 24 we're gonna we're gonna go through some some reading uh, one of the things that I learned 
um, through our leadership meeting and you see me talking about this, but you'll start seeing some other individuals that will in the, uh, in the recent future um, uh, will be sharing with individuals things that they learn. I believe as a pastor, uh, my responsibility is to be the first partaker and share what I learned. And so, um, again, one of the things that I heard uh, in the leadership conference was that um, in order to move the people in the direction that they need to go, you have to teach for change. You have to teach for change. Preaching is good. Preaching does the gathering. We understand that. But teaching is for discipling. Teaching is for equipping. So while a lot of times we want our emotions tickled, <laughs> we, we really would rather for our emotions to be tickled. But God is not concerned about your emotions. He's concerned about transformation. So my job as pastor of this church is not so much to be into your emotions. While your emotions is important to me, uh, you know, because it's you and it's what, what helps you and your emotions are, are, are important to me. But your emotions are not as important to me as your soul. Your soul is more important to me than how you feel. So sometimes people, in their emotions, they get mad. But if you do what God says, they'll get glad. But if you only teach for the emotion, they'll be always emotionally unstable. The word of God comes to settle us and bring us to a place where we need to be. It's no good to have all of this and don't know why you have it. Amen? So let's, 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 let's find out what the culture of the church is or what the culture of the believer should be. And those of you that were on in Bible class, you understand. So I'm going to go back through some things in Bible class because sometimes, guess what we got to have? We have to have review. When you were in school, what did you have? You had the drill. And the drill was the lesson from yesterday that you were in to see if you still remembered it. And then what they did was built off of in terms of the next lesson. And so the word of God says, and whatsoever ye do, whatsoever you do, whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Put your whole heart in it. Put your whole heart in it. You can tell when a person put their whole heart in it or if they just did it because Amen. you said to do it. But when you put your whole heart in it, you put your best in it. You put your best foot forward. My question to you, and I'm going to give you some things that I want you to write down. I don't want you to answer them, but I want you just to write them down. I want you to write them down. Am I giving God my absolute best? Right, right, right. Write that down. And, and this week, what I want you to do is I want you to go back through it, and I want you to answer those questions. Am I giving God my absolute best? Or am I only giving him what he wants when I want something from him? Am I giving him my absolute best? Or do I just show up when I want something from him? And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto what? The Lord. And not unto what? Men. So when I sing, when I preach, when we, when we serve, on our jobs, in our homes, 
Are you working for the Lord? Or are you doing it to be seen? There's a reason why you have to do it unto the Lord. The reason why you have to be connected to the Lord because men will oftentimes disappoint you. And if, in fact, you're doing it only for man, then your relationship will soon dwindle. It'll fade away. Man don't even have to try to disappoint you. Sometimes it's just life. Sometimes it's misunderstanding. Sometimes it's not disappointed men at all. It's how you see it. Have you ever had a relationship with a person and, and you, you did your best, but it was how they saw it? And when they saw it that way, you couldn't change the way they saw it? You tried your best. You did everything you possibly could do, but it was the way they saw it. So sometimes relationships grow away because of how we see it. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Once we get on two different roads, guess what we're going to do? We're going to see something different. Okay? So it's very important that whatever you do, you do unto the Lord and not unto men. All right? 24th verse. Knowing that the Lord ye shall receive, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. You're not working for free. Tell somebody, say, I'm not working for free. Now, it's okay to say that. But if you're working for men, when men doesn't give you what you think you should have, you'll quit. When men doesn't pat you on the back, when men doesn't acknowledge you, when men doesn't do certain things, what happens is you soon quit. But if you're doing it unto the Lord, you don't care if nobody says anything or not. Why? Because I know God's got it all recorded. Even if you don't feel as though I'm significant or important, God's got it all under control. He's got it all recorded because he knows that what I'm doing, I'm doing it unto the Lord. And isn't it amazing people who do things for men only do things when men are looking. Yeah. But people who do things for the Lord, even when men are not looking, their heart is into it. They're connected. Are you hearing me? So that's how you can tell whether you're working for the Lord. You can tell, what do you do when people are not looking? Right? I know that we're not perfect, but we should be striving for that perfection. Right? I don't have to, I don't have to have a, a room full of people to worship God. I oftentimes, one of the things, when you tell, can I tell you one of my favorite things to see is when I get here to the church and I see people just in the church by themselves on the altar just praying and nobody's here. When nobody is here, it makes me feel good to see somebody here at the church praying. Sometimes people say, I come here and I can't get in, but I'll, I'll sit on the parking lot and I'll, I'll just pray. I'll just, I'll just sit on the parking lot and I'll just come up here and whisper a word of prayer. See, it's what you do unto the Lord that counts. Does that make sense? All right, go ahead. He said... He, he said, he said, turn it back, go back, go back. Uh, knowing the ship received reward from the Lord, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Who do you serve? The Lord, Christ. the Lord Christ. He's Lord. Notice, capital L. He's Lord. Sarah called Abraham her Lord, but that was lowercase l. He is Lord. There's no one above him. He's Christ. He is the anointed one. 
He's Lord. He's Christ. He is the anointed one who has come to deliver me. He's not just anybody. He is Lord Christ. I'm going to receive my reward from Lord Christ. Go ahead. 25th verse. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. Notice now. For he that doeth wrong shall receive what? The wrong for the wrong which he has what? Done. Now, now, now this next clause is very, very important. Because sometimes in homes, people will feel as though, oh, I'm the favorite. And this person is not the favorite. So this is God said, this is how I run my house. He said, and there is no respected person. Look at somebody to the right and left of you say, he'll get me and he'll get you too. He don't have no favorites. Why? Because he's concerned about getting us to where we need to be. So I shared, I shared on, on Wednesday night that passion leads to purpose. Passion leads us to purpose. Those of you that are writing down, write that down. Please help me out over there, Montez. Passion leads to purpose. However, what stops a man from being passionate about what he does or what he believes? Have you ever had passion about something and then all of a sudden seemed like that passion is not there anymore? That passion seemed to have been challenged. You see, this kind of teaching sort of makes us sort of get sleepy, you know, because the devil don't want us to have it. Amen. But I'm telling you, it'll be good for you if you take it. Passion leads to purpose, and the devil does not want you to discover or find out or operate in your purpose. He wants you to be, he wants you to live, but live with no purpose. My question to you, my next question that I want you to write down is, what is your purpose? Why have you been in church all of these years and still have not discovered your purpose? Why are you still waiting for some prophet from out of town to come and tell you what God has already told you? Why are you searching through YouTube trying to find a word to confirm what God has already told you? You remember a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. At some point, you have to grow up and find out, I got to do what God called me to do. Every day that you don't operate where God told you to operate or do what God told you to do. Now listen, most people get what I'm saying mixed up with preaching. Tell somebody, say, he ain't talking about preaching. There's more to life than preaching. I don't know why everybody think that the only thing significant in church is to preach. So tell somebody, say, he ain't talking about preaching. Matter of fact, he calls you to some things that you don't want to do before he calls you to the pulpit. Anybody trying to rush to the pulpit and trying to bypass the process won't be able to stand in the pulpit when they get there. Amen. So what does he call you to first? He calls you to clean the, clean the church when ain't nobody there. Can you be faithful in that? Commit this thing to what? Faithful men. Commit it to... What? Faithful men. So how do I, how do you know that you're faithful if you don't take the small task? And if you can't complete the small task, how are you going to do the big task? Oh, that's too small for me. 
Oh, ain't nobody here for that. And when it's too small, you don't want to do it, then guess what? You're not passionate about it. Can I tell you, you can't even be saved without being passionate. That's why people are trying to make salvation so easy for people. But you got to be passionate about salvation. Want to know why? Because as soon as something come up and you're not passionate about it, guess what you're going to do? You're going to throw your hands up and you're going to quit. Are, are you hearing me? So what, are you, what is your purpose? Can I tell you how to find your purpose? You find your purpose when you find your passion. Whatever you're passionate about will lead you to your purpose. Now, I have a friend in the room. I won't call his name because I'm on the line. He loves to cook. I see him on Facebook, and he has his grill out, and he's, man, whew, Lord, beautiful. But he loves to feed people. Well, he may say, what is my purpose? It's serving people. Serving people. Serving people. Serving people. We have some individuals who love to make sure that the church is clean right after, ch after service. What is, what, is my, what is my purpose? It's the ministry of helps. It is making sure that I do what's necessary to push the program along. Do you see? So therefore, everybody is not called to the pulpit. Everybody's not called to the praise team. Listen, yes. Everybody has a noise, and I talked about that the other day, and God wants to hear everybody, but not everybody do you give the lead mic to. You know, you can blend in, but not everybody has the lead mic. You know I'm telling the truth. You, you understand? So therefore, when we understand what our purpose is, it leads us, or a passion is, it leads us to a purpose. If, if you're passionate, you want to know what? Nobody has to tell you to be on time. You're going to be on time. So I, as the pastor, when you come to me and you say, well, I've been called to do this, I've been called to do this, I watch how passionate you were about coming to church on time. How do you handle bumps in the road? Because if I put you up front and every time there's a bump in the road that comes, you get gone, it's more of a catastrophic uh, uh, event to the church when you go through something because everybody going to want to know where you at. Come on now. Y'all hear what I'm talking about? You, you know, you know, you all right long as everything's going all right in your life. But as soon as something happened, guess what happened? You quit on God. Not quit on the church. You quit on God. So God doesn't come to tempt us. Somebody shout, God does not come to tempt you. But he will test you. He doesn't come to tempt you, but he will test you. So therefore, what happens? If you can't do the small things, how can you be trusted with the greater things? Are you hearing me? So one of the things the facilitator said to me, so to us, he said, never give a person a job that's not passionate about the job that they have. Because if they're not passionate about the job that they have, guess what's going to happen? They're going to drop the ball. They're going to be what we call a slacker. They want to get paid. Notice what I said, everybody gets paid, but they don't want to do the job. So every time you call and find out, did you do the job? Did you do the job? Did you do the job? Guess what's going to happen? It's going to be excuses after excuses after excuses after excuses. By the time you get to the third excuse, guess what? You don't want to hear no more. Now, you can take the first one. You can take maybe the second one. But by the time you get to the third one, what you doing? Trying to find somebody else that's got passion to do the job. Another thing he shared with me, he says, he 
says that when you pick a person, how do you pick a person? He said, well, I used to pick the qualified, but now I pick the overqualified. He said, because you outgrow the qualified, but the overqualified, you got some room. He said, and you never stop learning or stop growing. Somebody shout, never stop learning and never stop growing. So the world is, is a, is a, is a, is a classroom in itself. So turn with me to Deuteronomy, the eighth chapter. We're going to do some teaching from that, and I hope you, you'll get something out of it. Again, God does not tempt us. Let no man say that when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. But God does try us. All right? You get that? Another question, what, is, what area of your life is God trying? Could it be that God is trying you? Could it be that God is not forsaking you, but he's trying you? So, again, before we get into this, can I share with you that if you're going to go to the palace, you have to be passionate in the pit. No one will get to the palace without going to the pit. Tell somebody, say, you can't get to the palace without going through the pit. So some of you right now, you're in the pit. And that pit has challenged your passion. So what did I say that challenges your passion? It's environment. Whenever your environment is jacked up, it messes with your passion. If my passion is messed up, then guess what? I abort my assignment and I'll throw up my hands and I'll never find my purpose. But God told me, he said, wait a minute, I don't care how messed up a person's environment is their passion for me should cancel out whatever's going on in their environment. Are you, are you hearing me? So for the world, for the world, environment cats cancels out passion. But for the church, environment should never cash out, cancel out passion. Why? Because I'm working for the Lord. Does that make sense? Trying to make it as plain as I can. Because I'm working for what? The Lord. And he has my reward. And all the promises in God is yea and amen. All right? So Deuteronomy 8 says this. And all the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may what? Live. That ye may live. I want you to live. I came that you may have life. Have that life more what? Abundantly. Abundantly. So God wants you to live. God just doesn't want you to shout and dance. God wants you to live. Somebody shout, I've got to live. I've got, to live. I've got if you have lost your passion, you're not living. If you lost your get up, you're not living. People who lose their passion, what do they do? They stay in the bed. Oh, Lord, I wish things were better. Oh, Lord, I, they don't like me, and they don't like me, and they don't like me. I told my wife today, my wife said, oh, Lord, today is going to be a hot day. I said, you ain't even made it outside yet. <laughs> That's how sometimes we start off our mornings. We... We, we pick up our cell phones and we, we look at the weather and we, we begin to automatically start conditioning our day by what we saw. Could it be an email that you got that stated how your day was going to go? Could it be some chaos in your home that stated 
how your day was going to go? Could it be the events that happened on yesterday that you are spilling over into the day that you say how your day was going to go? I told my wife, I said, listen here, I'm going to tell you, we serve a God that's so awesome. I don't care if it's 90 degrees outside. If you focus on the goodness of the Lord, you could be going through and don't even feel it. Everybody else is going through it, but you don't even feel it. I don't care what's happening around you. Somebody else got a cold. Somebody sneezed on you. Oh, Lord, I feel it. I feel it coming down. Oh, God, I feel it already. Somebody else tell you that bad news? That bad news jumps off on you? I'm trying to tell you, wait a minute. Don't let that stuff into your environment. Oh, you know, it, it, there's more to church than just jumping and shouting and speaking in tongues. Because after you jump and shout and speak in tongue, you got to live. All right. Are you, are you hearing me? So now we got to teach this. So how do you live? You observe to do all of the commandments of what? The Lord. Whatever he said do, do it. And if you do it, guess what you're going to do? You're going to live. So how do you live? By doing and obeying what God says. Now listen, if that's all you got today, my job is done. But I'm going to show you how he does it. That you may live and what? Wait a minute. And not just live, but what? Multiply. Multiply. Everybody that's attached to you, can I tell you that God wants your whole family saved? You have to get beyond just talking about, oh, God wants to save me. Can I tell you that God wants to do a whole lot more than save you? He wants to save everything that's connected to you. Everything that you come in contact with. I'm talking about coworkers. I'm talking about friends. I'm talking about everybody that you come in contact with. God wants to bless everything that's attached to you. Would you please reach over and tell somebody, say, listen, you're blessed because we, are, we, we hooked up. Now, look, you got to be careful who you hook up with. Because if people are negative, guess what? They can also subtract. And can I tell you some problem, sometime the problem that you have is who you hooked up to? If a person don't love and honor God, you got to treat them with a long-handled spoon. I need somebody that when I talk about the word that their baby leaps on the inside. I need somebody to bounce this thing off that understands to get excited about what I get excited about. Feels what I feel. I don't need nobody challenging me every time. Hey, come on now. Even in the natural. Even in the natural. You have, you have, you have vision. You have goals. You have, and people say, I don't see why you doing that. Why are you doing that? I don't, I don't see. And they don't believe. They don't believe because they couldn't do it. They feel like you can't do it. And when you hang around people like that, they're like leeches. They suck the life out of you. They suck the passion out of you. And how many people have been held up in your life because you just hung around the wrong people? Tell somebody, say, ain't nothing wrong with you. Your people choice is the problem. All those people that said something was wrong with you, can I tell you it was really something wrong with them? Come on, tell somebody, say, say I'm going to save you a whole lot of money. I'm going to save you a whole lot of money. I'm going to save you some pills. I'm going to save you a whole lot of money. I'm going to save you a lot of co-pays. Uh, it's not wrong, something wrong with you. There's really something wrong with them. Because the bigger your dream is, the more you trust in God, the more you believe God for, the more people are going to try to stop you from believing in the God that you serve. And I told you how to get it. You got to what? Observe to do what? All that he commanded you to do. So here I, I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to do right. And I'm trying, ain't nobody ever done that. 
I'm going to tell you, if you start doing something for the Lord, you're going to find out you got some haters. Now, I'm not a hater preacher, but I, I just want to give you something for free. Look at somebody say, listen, if you start doing something for the Lord and you start cleaning yourself up and you start coming to church and you start doing what God wants you to do and God start blessing you, you're going to have some haters. And can I tell you something that's going to help you? Lord have mercy. I'm going to have to bring this to the next service. Can I tell you something that's going to help you? You're going to be surprised who your haters are. Woo, just look straight. Don't look, don't look around. Just look straight. Just look straight. You're going to be surprised that sometimes your haters are in your inner circle. Because if they can't openly celebrate you, could it be that they are privately trying to assassinate you? See, we get happy for one another. We, we get happy for one another. He says, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. That, that, that's all I can go. I, I'm going go, to go into it, uh, the next service. But uh, we had a member in our church, and I've been preaching on uh, uh, dancing and, 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 and shouting before you get it. You remember, remember Pastor Vintan, you got to learn to shout before you get it. You got to learn to go in and just dance even though it looks like all avenues are closed. You got to learn to shout before you get it. And sometimes people look at you and they just look like, does that stuff work or is he just trying to get me emotionally stimulated? Well, I had a young lady came in my office and she says, Pastor, I want a house. She said, I want you to pray over this contract. We're going to pray, and I want to submit for a house. Well, the first time she put it in, it came back denied. She couldn't get it. She said, well, maybe another house is for me. I'll go to the next house. Second time, I think, it also. But she said, I know God gave me this house. And sometimes what we try to do is we try to get something else to substitute. And it's not what God told you. And so she tried to get some things that, to substitute. But because she had put the praise on the house that she wanted. Are you hearing me? God says, no, my word is on what I already said. While she was going through the pit process. She remained faithful, yeah. kept doing what she was supposed to do, kept coming to Bible class, sneaking out of work, coming to Bible class, uh, leaving church, working all night and all kinds of things and working through to get to the house of the Lord. Going through a tough time, but yet not throwing in the towel, being faithful. Being faithful, somebody said, say faithfulness counts. Faithfulness. Being faithful. And then guess what? She says, I'm going to call and check back on that house. Realtor said, and I got permission to talk about it this morning, incidentally. Uh, the realtor said, uh, the realtor said, no, nah, that house is sold. We got a contract on it, house is sold. She said, but I believed it was my house. I believed it was mine. I don't care what is going on out there. I believe God gave it to me. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? She said the Lord told her to call back in two weeks. When I called back in two weeks, the man said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That deal, well, that deal fell through. She started dancing right there where she was, started praising God. She said, it's my house. That's what you got to do. You got to learn to start praising God before it happens. Called a realtor and said, look, take me to this place. She said, when I went in, Pastor, I just automatically started praising God. I just went in automatically and started praising God. Can I tell you? She got a new house. She got the house that she wanted. What am I saying? When you go through the pit process, 
And there's so much more I have to say. But when you go through the pit process, what do you do? Do you stop coming to church? Or do you keep coming to church? Do you stop being faithful? Or do you throw in the towel? Do you go to the why me Lord syndrome? You know, you know, most of us go through what are called the why me Lord syndrome. I, in other words, when you say why me Lord, you, what you're saying is why couldn't it be my brother or sister? Why do I have to go through what I'm going through? You shouldn't want anybody to go through it. Are you hearing me? It's all right long as it ain't you. Oh, sister so-and-so, I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying that you are forever here with the word of the Lord say. And when is you? Oh, God, why me? Pastor, why did this have to happen to me? Well, it was okay when it happened to sister so-and-so. Everybody has to learn to survive through their own pit experience. What do you do in your pit experience? Does it take your passion? Does it take your drive? Does it make you give up? I want you to know you'll never make it to the palace until you've learned how to survive through the pit. The pit is tough. There's no water in the pit. There's no bread in the pit. The pit is tough. But Jeremiah teaches us how to survive through the pit. When he got in the pit, it messed with his psyche. He said, listen, he said, I, I, when I thought about this, I said, I'm not going to preach no more. I'm going to give up. Tell somebody the pit. He said, but when he thought about it, there was something that started happening down the inside. When he thought about giving up on a faithful God, when he thought about throwing in a towel on a faithful God, hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, God is faithful. God is faithful. Come on, I, I, want you, I want you to get something in you today, hallelujah. Come on, put it in so somebody say, I don't care what you go through. God is, God is faithful. When Jeremiah said God is faithful, he said it was just like fire. Shut up in the bones. Can I tell you that God will give you water when there's no water in the pit. He'll give you bread when there's no bread. Hallelujah seeming to fall. When you read the rest of this Deuteronomy 8, he'll show you how he sustained them 40 years in the desert when there was nobody around they had a big pit tell somebody say a big pit 40 years in the desert nobody feeding them nobody sustaining them but God bought them through can I tell you that God told me to tell you he's going to bring you through but you can't wait till the battle is over you got to learn to praise God now is your environment is your environment sucking the passion out of you are you only serving God because he's he's doing what you want him to do or can you serve him hallelujah when things are going chaotic when things hallelujah are going I know what God said I'm going to stand right here and I'm going to wait until he does what he said he's going to do I come to stir somebody up again to tell you to dream again. I come to tell somebody, reevaluate where you are. God has not given up on you. God is just taking you through a little testing time to see if you can handle the pit. Because if you can't handle the pit, when you get to the palace, you're going to act crazy. Oh, hallelujah. But I'm looking for about 25 folk in this here this morning that say, Lord, hallelujah, I may be in the pit, but I still love you. I may be going through, but I still love you. I may not understand what's going on, God, but I still love you. And there's something about, hallelujah, going through. It's something about going through that even when the enemy realizes or thinks, thinks that he's setting you up for failure. He's only bringing you to the divine plan of where God wants you to be. Is there anybody here that can say, I thought I was going down. I thought, hallelujah, it was over. I thought 
that God didn't love me but when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me my soul cries out what causes your soul to cry out other than understanding if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side the enemy would have swallowed me up and took me out of here So the pit was actually the road to the palace. Come on, look at somebody say the pit. The pit that I didn't understand, the pit that I couldn't figure out was actually the road to the palace. Who hallelujah. If you cannot handle the pit, you will not ever get to the palace. And I'm kind to tell somebody today that, hallelujah, you're missing the greatest opportunity to give God a praise. You're missing the greatest opportunity. I didn't just say you clap your hands. I mean open your mouth. Shout with the victory. Shout with triumph. Hallelujah. If you knew what I was going through, hallelujah, glory be to God, hallelujah, you would, under, you, you would say, how are they praising God? But God says, that's what I get glory out of. When all hell says, I got them, I'm going to kill them, they're going to die in the, pet, in the pit. But heaven is saying, I'm just waiting on them. I'm just waiting on them to open their mouth and give me praise. Because when the praises go up, blessings come down. Oh, hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know you may be in a pit and I know it may be rough, but that's a good sign to praise God. That's a good sign to say that you're on your way. Somebody shout, I'm on my way. So because I got two more services, I'll stop right now. Reach over, grab somebody by the hand. Tell them, say, God's ways are not your ways. 73rd chapter of a number of Psalms said, My foot almost slipped. When I saw, notice now, the prosperity of the wicked. The devil will make you see some things in your pit. Whoo, hallelujah. What are you looking at in your pit? Are you looking at the prosperity of the wicked? Are you looking to the hills from which come of your help? For your help coming from the Lord. Can I tell you, you're looking at the wrong thing in your pit? You can't make it, hallelujah, if you're looking at the prosperity of the wicked. My foot almost slipped. But later on again, he said, then I got to the sanctuary. Whoo, hallelujah. Look at your neighbor say, neighbor, the devil didn't want, to, want you to make it to church today. Because he thought you were going to die in the pit. But you got to the sanctuary. Woo, hallelujah. Come on, tell somebody. He thought you were going to die in the pit. But the pit was the road to the palace. If I be lifted up, pit. If I be nailed to the cross, pit. If I be whipped pit I'm going to draw all men unto me can I tell you how to make it when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me look at your neighbor say neighbor I'm glad that you sat next to me this morning I get joy when we hook up but I want you to know, I brought my praise with me. I brought my praise with me. I come to let you know, 
that the blind can't lead the blind. But I came to let you know, I know the escape right from the pit. I know how to get out of the pit. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I know because I was there. I know because the devil thought he had me. But I got away. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, when I praise him, you praise him with me. And unity will release the supernatural. Woo, hallelujah. I feel God in this house saying that somebody is moving from the pit to the palace. Somebody, if you could just look beyond what you're going through, you'll understand it better by and by. Don't look at the pit. Look at the purpose that God has put on your life. Look at the calling that God has placed on your life. Look at the dreams that God has put in your spirit. That's why you're still alive. That's why you're still here. Don't die in the pit. Don't die in the pit. Get yourself up. Say, I'm getting my passion back. I'm getting my joy back. I don't care what the devil did. The kingdom suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Get your mind together. Know who you're talking to. I'm talking to the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. Oh, hallelujah. Who can resist? Who can stand against the Lord Almighty? Weapons come, but they will not be able to prosper. Good God Almighty. They shall come seven way, one way, but they shall flee seven ways. When I walk and I hold on to God's unchanging hand. Woo, hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. Look at your neighbors and neighbor. You got to go through the pit before you get to the palace. I want to give you the reason why. Because pride goeth before fall. A haughty spirit. God hates and resists pride. So he said, I could have expedited the process. But I had to work some stuff out of you. So when you get there, you'll understand. Whew. God loved me so much that he delivered me out of the pit. He loved me so much that he delivered me from the jail cell. No matter where I was, he kept talking to me. No matter where I was, he kept speaking to me. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we hold those hands, as we hold those hands, Father, in the name of Jesus, strengthen my sister, strengthen my brother, who may be going through a pit experience, but they ask you to take them higher. They asked for something that they didn't know what they had to go through to get it. But you're a God that will not lie. And as long as we stay in the spirit of being complacent, we'll never get to where we have to be. God stirs it up to find out where we be faithful in the pit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He stirs us up to find out. Will you love me? When it seems like I'm not talking. Will you love me? When it seems like I have forsaken you. Will you love me? When it seems like there's no water. Woo, hallelujah. I want you to know he's taking you from the pit. To the palace. And look at your neighbor as you hold those hands and say, listen, when I get there, when I get there, there's going to be room for you. 
Come on, hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, when I get there. Not if I get there. But when I get there. There's going to be a blessing. Not just for me. But there's going to be a blessing for the whole house. Somebody shout, this blessing that God is ready to do got your name on it too. Woo, hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. Oh, somebody shout, he's working some stuff out of me. He's working some stuff out of me. Let God work the stuff out of you. Stop being selfish. Stop trying to do some of what he said and do all of what he said. And the blessings of God will overtake you. God bless you. Did anybody get anything out of the day? Yeah, with somebody say, I'm moving from the pit to the palace. But while I'm in this pit, I shall never cease to praise you. I shall never cease to give you glory. Can anybody just praise God for the pit this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said really, can anybody really praise God for the pit this morning? It's our difficult situations in our life that brings us to the greatest destiny that God would desire for us to have. Had it not been difficult, you may not be in church right now. Yes, God. Thank you. But it was the difficult situations that brought you to the house of the Lord. Oh, whatever God has to use, say, use it, Lord. Just bring me to the wealthy place. Bring me to where you want me to be. Ah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll do part two next service. Amen. If you are here and you don't know.